Well, good morning. Good to see everybody today. I hope all of you had a good week and uh, ready to uh, worship the Lord this morning. Uh, praise the Lord for the rain yesterday and what we've had the last few days. Most of the time I seems like around here, at least where I live, it goes around this way, around that way, but at least it came over yesterday, so we had a good, good rain. Good to see some of you back that have been away for a while. Miss Linda, good to see you and others. So uh, if you would this morning as we get ready to worship the Lord, if you'll open your bulletins, the words are actually in the bulletin this morning for a call to worship. Yes, Lord, yes. You all know this by song, this little uh, uh, song we sing in this morning. So if you would, let's please stand and we'll go through this twice. <laughs> so good to see you this morning and, and a joy to welcome you to this this time of worship we are so glad you're here today and as we gather and worship the Lord uh, this is a, a, a different time of a start to school year I want to talk about that for a minute every like everything else starting school is so different this year and uh, um, so I want us to take a few moments and, and pray for our schools some like in Columbia County have already started I think Duffy County uh, starts tomorrow, and um, so, and everything's different. You know, kids are going to be learning at home, and teachers are having to teach virtually or over the, online, and, and um, it, it's a learning as you go along, and so a lot, of, a lot of things are going on with that, and so I think it's especially important now that we pray for our teachers, our principals, school superintendents, and among the things I thank the Lord for, I'm thankful I'm not a school superintendent or a principal or a teacher right now. That's, uh, that's a blessing in my life, but I do want us to pray for them. Join me in prayer. Father, we do thank you and praise you for this day that you've blessed us with. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you. And we know as school is starting or has started in some schools already, we just want to lift up our schools to you now. We want to lift up our, our school administrators, the superintendent, and those that serve with, with, with her and, and superintendents in other counties around us. We want to lift up our, those that, that work with the superintendent uh, uh, in central office like Leslie and, and just bless them, Father, guide them. Father, we pray for the teachers. We pray for the students. We pray for the parents. We always, it's always talked about that education is a joint endeavor and that's never more true than it is right now because it's requiring everyone. And Lord, we just pray that, that they'll be guided by your wisdom, that they'll seek your wisdom, that, that, uh, that you'll be glorified in all of this. Lord, I especially pray for the children. Lord, it's... it's it's obvious that there are children in a school district of any size that come from homes that are not, not a positive place where there's abuse there. And the school is their safe, their safe place. The school is where they get affirmed. And Lord, I especially pray for those children who are in those environments that you'll just protect them and watch over them. 
And Lord, in, in line with all this, we just continue to pray that you just wipe this virus from the face of the earth. We just pray that you just wipe it out, Father, so that um, children can return to face-to-face -face learning, and which, which, is, which is what they need. And Father, we just pray your blessings upon our schools and pray that um, all will be done for your glory and you'll be glorified in it all. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. The next song this morning as we sing is hymn number 301, I Am Resolved. And it's got five verses, so this is our only other song we're singing this morning, so we're going to sing all five. So I will let you remain seated as we sing. So I Am Resolved, hymn 301. special organ and she said please say something while I get ready so <laughs> uh, the title of her song this morning is called the Lord is my life and it's based on Psalms 27 verse 1 and the verse says the Lord is my life and my salvation whom shall I fear the Lord is the strength of my life of whom shall I be afraid and again I thank Miss Ann for playing this morning and bringing our special music so go ahead Miss Ann when you get ready
great psalm and a great song. Okay. Miss Ann, thank you for that so much. If you ask me to get your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, we'll be looking at uh, verses 17 through verse 42 this morning. So that shouldn't take but about an hour or so, should it? Let me ask you this question as you're finding that. Do, does being a Christian, a, a follower of Christ, does it give us a pass? Does it give us permission to not obey the laws of our community or state or our nation? Does that give us a pass on that? Let, let me illustrate that in, in a practical way. Uh, suppose, you're, suppose you're riding down I-20, speeding at 70 miles an hour, and you're doing 100. Now, I know none of you would ever do that, or have never done that. <laughs> Some of you are laughing and looking at one another. And a police officer pulls you over, and he says to you, do you know how fast you're going? Yes, sir, I was doing 100. I can do that because I'm a Christian. I don't have to obey the law. Do you get a ticket? Absolutely. The bigger question is, do you go to jail, right? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. So it does not give us a pass. Well, what about paying taxes? Can you send a letter to the IRS? I'm a Christian and therefore I don't have to pay taxes. Of course not. You can send a letter, but I imagine someone will come and try to collect that tax from you. We must obey the laws of the land, correct? In fact, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 13, verse 1 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except by God, and those that exist have been, been instituted by God. But here's another question. What if the government is commanding us to do something that is contrary to God's word? What do we do then? What if the government orders us to do something that is contrary to God's word? For example, what if the government were to come and issue a proclamation that said, <coughs> You cannot go and share your faith with anyone else. You cannot do that. It's against the law. What do you do? What do you do? Well, this morning in Acts chapter 5, we're going to see where the apostles were commanded by their government to do that which was contrary to God's word. And they faced a choice. They could either obey the government or they could obey God but it was impossible to do both. If you know the, the biblical account, you know what they did. But let's talk about that. This is an important message for, for today because there are Christians, even in America today, even this morning, who were facing this same challenge. The first thing we see, the first point is this, the truth always reveals. The truth always reveals. God's word is the truth. There is not your truth and my truth. There, there are not many truths. There is only God's truth, and it is contained in his, his word, the Bible. And everything we might think is true and right must be filtered through God's word to determine whether it is indeed true or not. The Word of God also reveals truth, and, and as a result, reveals what is untrue. But God's Word is seen as a danger by those who stand against it. Look at verses 17 and 18 in Acts chapter 5. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. So once again, as he had previously, the high priest and his associates were very, very upset. They were angry. It says they were jealous. They were, they were so jealous they were angry at these apostles. They were enraged at the apostles for several reasons. First of all, the apostles denied the, the religious doctrine of the religious leaders. 
Their preaching on the resurrection of Jesus was in direct conflict with the Sadducees' teaching, who denied the resurrection. In fact, the Sadducees denied anything that was supernatural. They denied angels. Secondly, the apostles defied their authority. They had given, in chapter 4, they had been given, they had given the apostles strict instructions to stop preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. But the apostles continued to do it. So they rejected the authority of the leaders. They also denounced them in another way. They held them responsible for the death of Jesus. In Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, they, they, they told them that they were responsible for the death of Jesus and needed to repent. And finally, the apostles were a danger to the, the power of the religious leaders over the people. They were filled with jealousy because more people were drawn to the apostles and the teaching and preaching of the gospel than they were to the religious leaders. And as they watched these, these people coming to the apostles and hearing the apostles preach and teach, seeing miracles happening over and over again, they witnessed how the people held the apostles in, in high honor and high esteem. And at the same time, they felt their own influence, their own power shrinking. So these religious leaders said something had to be done. But the problem they had was this. God's word, God's truth cannot be stopped. Their opposition backfired and rather than stopping the truth, it provided an opportunity for God to display his power. Look at verses 19 and into, 20, into verse 21. So these, these apostles are in prison, okay? During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. See, this angel did more than just release the apostles from prison. He gave them specific, a specific commission, didn't he? The apostles were told to take their stand and keep on speaking the, to the people all the words of this life. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the only way someone can be saved. They were not free from prison to go hide and protect themselves. They were free from prison so they could boldly return to the temple. <clears throat> And continue to proclaim the gospel. Now let's look at verse, 20, verse 21 and follow. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council and all the senate of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in prison. So they returned and reported, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. Now, there's humor in parts of the Bible. And this is one of those spots where they assume these apostles were in prison. They go and unlock the doors and they're nowhere to be found. The doors are locked, the guards, was, don't you think those guards felt foolish, foolish guarding, a, guarding an empty cell? They had told them not, not to be out teaching, and yet they're out doing that. Before the Sanhedrin were even aware, and this is, this is just an amazing scene here, before the, San, the Sadducees, rather, were even aware that the apostles had been released, they were already back preaching the word to the people in the temple area. Look at verses 27 28. 
And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them. And he pulls out his, the, the high priest now pulls out his, his I'm in charge, his, I'm, I'm, in, I'm the authority card. We, char we strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. You know one of the things I think that's interesting? I think it's, one of the things that's interesting here is the high priest never asked the apostles how they got out of prison. Wouldn't you want to know that if you were him? I mean, his guards, the people go there, the doors are locked, no one's inside. The guards saw nothing, heard nothing. He never asked them how they had been delivered from prison. I suspect he knew. I suspect he knew that they had been miraculously delivered from prison. It was obvious something supernatural, something miraculous had happened but it did not fit into his way of thinking. It did not fit into his theology. It did not fit into his program. And so he was not going to ask the question because he did not want to give the apostles a chance to give praise and glory to God. Instead, he reminds them of his order to them. We strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. Now, this statement by the high priest actually is a compliment to the apostles because it's an admission on his part of the effectiveness of their preaching and teaching and their witness there in Jerusalem. Because he says, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. That's effective, isn't it? He actually, without knowing it, paid them a compliment. And yet he, he seems so, to be so shocked that the apostles would dare go against his order. Then the high priest states to the, to the apostles, you intend to bring this man's blood on us. Talking about Jesus. Apparently he misunderstood the, the purpose of what the apostles had said. Probably because of his own guilty conscience. He, he seemed to think that the apostles wanted to bring revenge, vengeance on them for the death of Jesus. When in reality the religious leaders, the, the apostles wanted the religious leaders to come under conviction of their sins so they might repent and be forgiven. The apostles' mission was to teach and preach about Jesus so that people could come to faith and obedience in Jesus Christ. Their mission was not to bring legal justice for a crime. Their only mission was to share the gospel with them, and that's what they did. Their, their concern was not vengeance on the high priest. Their concern was his eternal salvation. The truth of God is a danger to those who reject it because ultimately it convicts them of their sins. The word of God reveals the truth, therefore it exposes untruth. So what was happening here as they were, they were revealing the truth of God, it, it was also revealing the untruth that the religious leaders believed. We come to point number three, and that is the truth must be proclaimed. The truth must be proclaimed. And the apostles came proclaiming the truth of God by obeying God. Look at verse 29. Here is one of the greatest professions of faith in all of Scripture in my estimation. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. We must obey God rather than men. Now let's unpack that for just a second. If you remember, the Lord Jesus had commanded the apostles to do what? To proclaim the gospel to all people. 
That was their commission. That was their call. That was their charge. Preach the gospel. Teach the gospel to all people. The religious authorities were commanding them not to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. So when faced with this choice, we are called by God to proclaim the gospel. We're being commanded by the, by the government not to proclaim the gospel. And when faced with this choice, the apostles boldly proclaimed, we must obey God rather than men. What if it comes to a point we have to make that decision? As I said last week, if it comes to that point, we, we need to have firmly set in our minds and in our lives now that if it comes to that point, I will obey God rather than men, whatever the consequences may be. You, we cannot wait until that time comes. I think that decision must be made now. You see, why do, I, why, why, do I, why do I have urgency about that? There are Christians in other parts of the world who have boldly proclaimed the gospel against their government's orders, and it has cost them their lives. And yet they boldly proclaim the gospel. There are Christians in America who in recent years refuse the government's order that they bake a cake or provide flowers for an occasion that that went against the truth of God's word, and in many cases, it cost them their business. And there are Christians today, here in America, who are ordered by the government of their state to not meet in their church buildings. And they're continuing to meet in their church buildings under the threat of fines and arrest. Because their commitment is, we must obey God rather than than men. They proclaim the, the, the apostles further they proclaim the truth by confronting sin. Look at verse 30. <clears throat> Talking to the high priest and the religious leaders they said the God of our fathers raised Jesus whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. They kept coming back to that didn't they? Why do they keep going back to the death and the resurrection of Jesus? Because that is central to the gospel. They were, they were charged with proclaiming the gospel. And if you're charged with proclaiming the gospel, you cannot leave out a central fact of the gospel. And that is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they, they charged the religious leaders with willfully rejecting and executing the Messiah, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, and therefore being in rebellion against God. They spoke the truth. They convicted. The, they spoke the truth about sin. We're, we're living in a time today where sin is, is running rampant in our society. And in many cases, in a lot of cases, sin is being celebrated in our society. And we must speak out against sin. We must call sin, sin, and not make excuses for it. Why? Because the Bible calls it sin. If the Bible calls something sin, it's sin, no matter what popular opinion says about it. They proclaim the truth about sin. They also proclaim the truth about exalting Christ, about glorifying Christ. Look at verse 31. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Here's the truth. We are all sinners in need of a savior, aren't we? And Jesus Christ is the only savior. He is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. He's the only way, only one through whom we can experience salvation through repentance and forgiveness of sin. So they exalted Christ, they glorified Christ. Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all, all men, all people to me. We have to lift up Jesus. We have to proclaim him and share him with those around us because that's what the Lord commanded us to do. They also 
proclaim the truth by their eagerness to be witnesses. Look at verse 32. It says that we were witnesses to these things, and so was the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. These apostles were, were witnesses to the earthly ministry of Jesus. They were, they were witnesses to his death on the cross. They were witnesses, in a sense, to his resurrection from the grave. They didn't actually see him walk out, but they encountered him later and spent time with him. And as witnesses, Christ called them to proclaim his name all over the world, and they faithfully obeyed him. And here is where it comes to you and I. The Lord has called us, every one of us, he calls every Christian to boldly proclaim the truth of the gospel to the lost. But the question is, are we, like the apostles, obeying him? Are we assuming someone will do it? The third point is this, the truth demands a decision. The truth demands a decision. Obedient Christians, obedient churches, will proclaim the truth of salvation only through Christ. And in many times, in many places, that, that will make waves against the culture and the world and Satan will retaliate in some form or another you see when a person is under conviction because of the proclamation of the gospel there are really three possible reactions one is hostility one is indecision another one is acceptance Let's look at the first one, hostility to the truth of the gospel. Look at verse 33. And when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. They wanted to kill the apostles. So the response of the priest and the others in the courtroom was anger and rage. The exposure of their sins so angered the members of the Sanhedrin, the, the religious leaders, that they could not even see straight. You ever been so angry you couldn't even think or see straight? I hope not. But that's what they were doing. You see, conviction either brings repentance or rejection, and rejection often brings anger. And the council was so angry they wanted to kill them. They responded to the truth with violent hostility. We see that in other parts of the world, as I mentioned earlier where people simply for living their Christian faith and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ are killed because the, the mom got violent. There's also an in, another, another response is an indifferent indecision to the truth of the gospel. Look at verse 34. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel a teacher of the law held in honor among all the people stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care of what you are about to do with these men. But for these days, Thetis rose up claiming to be somebody and a number of other men, a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. <laughs> After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in this present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God, so they took his advice. So at this point, the apostles found a really unlikely ally in, in Gamaliel. Remember, he is the teacher under whom Paul studied when he was Saul. He was a great rabbi, he was basic, and he basically argues that the Sanhedrin should just stop and think before they act. They, and that's pretty good advice, isn't it, to stop and think before you act. 
And even though we can praise Gamaliel as a wise and gracious man, it's really only worldly advice he gives here. It sounds like good reasoning, but it's not. This line of thinking that Gamaliel gave, it really has some faults to it. Let me just share a couple. First of all, he classified Jesus as just another troublemaker. He lists some troublemakers in the past that, that led up this, this, this group of people, and then when that troublemaker died, it all went away. So he's including Jesus as just another troublemaker. Second, he assumes that history always repeats itself. Just as the, the previous rebels had been subdued and their followers scattered, so, so were the followers of Jesus, he assumed. And third, he had the mistaken idea that if something was not of God, it always fails. But we know that's not true, no. Some things, things, sometimes things that are not of God don't fail. Sometimes they succeed in the worldly sense. Fourth, he assumed it was possible to be neutral about Jesus, but it's not. He was right, however, when he asserted that if it is of God, you will not be able to stop it. You won't be able to stop it. But it seems amazing to me that Gamaliel would even entertain the possibility that the apostles were were actually on God's side and were divinely ordained and, and divinely empowered to do what they're doing. But he did. What else do we know about Gamaliel? Nothing. Tragically, as far as we know, he did not commit his life to Christ. Instead, as far as we know, he probably died waiting to see whether this Christian movement was really of God and would last. The call of the gospel is to respond to God's invitation now, isn't it? Now. While there's still time, Gamaliel kept, he, he may have, and I'm speculating here, he may have been thinking, well, if something comes of it, then I'll check it out. But there's a possibility he didn't last long enough to check it out. So when you're sharing the gospel with someone, you don't want to pressure them into this, uh, to a decision, but at the same time, we need to emphasize to them that it's important to make a decision soon because life is so brief and life is so fragile. Don't sit on the fence like Gamaliel did. The third response is just, just acceptance, absolute acceptance of the truth of the gospel. That's what the apostles demonstrate here. Look in verse 40 and follow. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus. Here we go again with that. Don't speak in the name of Jesus. And let them go. You would think by now they would know that charge was not effective on these folks, wouldn't you? They weren't going to obey this. And then verse 41, then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus is the Christ. The apostles had demonstrated or responded to the gospel with saving acceptance and were committed to both obeying Christ no matter what the circumstances were. Nothing would stop them, not threats from the, the government authorities, the religious authorities, nothing stopped them. How many times were they told? In chapter 4 we see it, twice here in chapter 5 we see it. They were told, do not teach or preach in this name anymore. And every time they walked out and immediately began to teach and preach in the name of Jesus. So what were the consequences of their obedience? First, the religious leaders had them physically beaten or flogged. That is an extremely painful physical experience from everything I've read. Miss Linda, it's kind of hard to believe it may be worse than shingles. <laughs> you can't imagine that, can you? I can't. Cannot. 
Probably, probably the effects feel about the same, I would guess. It was extremely painful. So we need to have that set in our mind. They, they beat them, they flogged them, and they dismissed them. But before they dismissed them, they ordered them again not to speak in the name of Jesus. So how did they respond? Remember, they've been flogged. Their backs are on fire. They're hurting so bad. They left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Why would they respond that way? Because they were doing exactly what Christ commanded them to do. He commanded them to go and proclaim the gospel, to teach the name of Jesus. And no matter what kind of opposition came their way, they continued to teach and preach the name of Jesus. They had been obedient. They had been faithful. So when they, when they faced retribution, that, retribution for that, they counted it an honor <coughs> to suffer because they were obedient to Christ. Now, they did not go out seeking suffering. They sought to be obedient to Christ. The suffering was a consequence. And they rejoiced over it. This is how else did they respond? Now remember, at least three times they've been told, do not teach and preach in this name anymore. Verse 42, every day, every day, in the temple and from house to house. So in the temple, then they go do home visitation and home evangelism going from house to house. They did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. How do you stop somebody like that if you're, if you're, if you only have earthly power, political power? You can't. You can't. They never stopped them from proclaiming the gospel. Oh, eventually they, they, executed all of them for proclaiming the gospel. But then somebody else just came in and obediently continued to teach and preach in the name of Jesus. You can't do anything on earth that has any eternal significance with a man or woman who's completely sold out and committed to be obedient to Jesus no matter what. There's nothing that can, that can be done. You know, Paul said, what, what was that? He said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. He said that while in prison. In essence, he was saying to, to the, prison, the prisoner, prison guards and prison officials, if you let me live, I'm going to continue to be faithful to Christ and obey Christ and serve Christ. If you kill me, I'm going home to be with Christ. So do whatever you want to. I'm going to be obedient. And Peter and the apostles responded to the threats of the religious leaders with the statement, we must obey God rather than man. This was so much more than just a, a nice sounding statement that would look good on a bumper sticker or something. It was so much more than that. It was the absolute commitment of their lives no matter what the consequences. No matter the consequences, they were going to obey God no matter what. May that be our commitment as well. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this great example in Scripture of these apostles who just were totally sold out to you and were committed to to obeying you no matter what. Well, we thank you for filling their heart, their lives with your Holy Spirit as you have filled our lives with your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the example of their boldness and their courage. And Lord, may we here in 2020 have that same commitment to, to, to draw on your strength, on the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit 
And may that be our commitment as well, that we will obey God no matter what the consequences. May that be our desire. May that be our commitment. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> our hymn of decision is hymn 447, Trust and Obey. If you need to respond publicly, won't you come as we stand and as we <clears throat> sing? Miss Linda wanted to share something with her church family this morning. Yes, I 